Well, our next speaker had to change his plans, I understand, in order to come here today, and I'm really grateful that he did so and that he's able to join us. I'm hesitant to say that uh, Senator Hertzberg needs no introduction, um, and while it is true that he is widely known and has many titles and has been called many things, <laughs> including an intense bundle of energy, and we were actually just m remarking on how you continue to have an incredible amount of energy, an all-night negotiator, and one of the 50 people who could save the planet. Uh, I happen to know that uh, Bob has done this both publicly in his public roles, but he's also invested privately in uh, in solar energy and in trying to get, have us have a more environmental friendly planet. It's something I'm really proud of that he's been engaged with. But I especially like the name and term Senator. Uh, Senator Robert Hersberg is the first former Speaker of the Assembly in almost 90 years to be elected to the California State Senate and one of only six lawmakers in California history to serve as both Assembly Speaker and Senator. So that's a r very rare uh, public uh, honor and distinction. I'm also happy to say that Bob is a member of the Price School's Board of Counselors, and his support and advice has been very important to me and the school. Bob's commitment to education broadly is evident from his work throughout California, including Cal Grant's program that serves as a pipeline for low-income students to access to colleges and universities. I know something that Bob cares a lot about getting school bond-related measures on the ballot, resulting in billions in school construction funds, and establishing a UC campus in the underserved county of Merced. The California Journal and Nonpartisan Magazine rated Bob as one of three elite members of the assembly and pointed to his problem-solving skills, his work ethic, and his serious brain wattage. I can vouch for that. Since his return to the legislature, he at legislature has taken on a number of tough issues uh, that are relevant to this gathering, including tax reform, environmental policy, and uh, criminal justice reform, as was just mentioned. He currently chairs the Senate Committee on Natural Resources and Water and serves on the Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Communications, the Committee on Governance and Finance, the Committee on Elections and Constitutional Amendments, and the Committee on the Judiciary. Outside of the legislature, he also serves along with other political leaders and practitioners from around the world on a very important body called Think Long Committee of California. Uh, it's part of the Bergruen Institute initiative focused on governance issues. So needless to say, uh, Bob has much to share with us this afternoon, and I'm really pleased to have him as a wonderful colleague and friend. So without further ado, Senator Bob Hertzberg. Thanks, Dean. I really appreciate it. And uh, I just want you to know that uh, when I was out of government, it was in Wales, where um, the, Dean Knott's wife introduced me to the first minister, which caused me to go to Wales to open my fac then factory, my second factory I took public. And had I been more successful, Price School would be named the Hertzberg School. I just want you to know. Don't doubt that. He was working me on that deal. He's going to give him shares. Yeah, try again. Don't worry. Got a few other. But let me, let me just say this. Thanks. And, and uh, where's Mr. Pound? Where'd he go? The institution over there. He's been working at this for a long, long, long time. I appreciate it. And, and um, you know, I mean, obviously, I on a number of public policy boards, they're very important to me. I I'm one of these crazy guys who served on a zillion boards to try to help the cause. Even when I was out of government, I was out of government for 12 years. And I, I do it because it's, it's such an important endeavor. And, and it's the reason why I counsel. I was supposed to be on a water tour today with Senator Vidak that he's pissed at me for not going on. But I said, I cannot miss this under any circumstances. It's just too important. So, but before, before I start, I want to just do a quick survey. How many people in this room either have or are working on a master's degree? Just out of curiosity. Either have or are working on a master's degree. How many people in this room have PhDs or are working on a PhD? Okay. How many lawyers? <laughs> okay. Well, that's, now we got three of us as a majority. <laughs> I love it. Look, 
here's what I wanted to do today. I want to take a little different role. You know, I know I saw your panels on the various subject matters and the note, the nature of this discussion of the changing role of states. And I want to take you back in a second and give a little context because the changing, I just went on Sunday and saw Hamilton and the Federalist Papers and those who were students discuss what was the role of states. This was the United States of America at a time where there were 13 colonies that had their own militias that printed their own money. And the discussions among the framers was this larger issue of what the role of the states was going to be. How much power are we going to give to the national government and how much is going to be reserved to the states? And if you look at history and the living nature of our Constitution, that role has changed. And so often, as public policy thinkers, as master's degree people and PhD people, you know, uh, we're trying to solve what's in front of us. But one of the greatest challenges that we have as public policy thinkers is that we live in a country where everybody has the right to travel, where freedom has consequences as public policy makers that cause us, when you're great su and success at what you do, that tomorrow it's no longer a success. And the human nature of people, I call it the, uh, actually Nathan Gardell's my buddy from the Think Long Committee, calls it the Diet Coke Society. Everybody wants, y y you know, the, the, the taste without the calories. They want the infrastructure without the taxes or the education without the costs, right? And so, you know, if we took and built the Santa Monica, the 405 in Los Angeles, say in North Dakota, people would be put in jail because why would you build 28 lanes or how many damn lanes the thing is, which is even though it was wide and still is too much traffic in North Dakota because there had to be somebody to be paid off. In California, they want to put you in jail because you don't have enough lanes. It is the challenge of public policy makers that we have to contextually always think, I think, in framing out our issues. You know, industrialization changed the need to enhance the power of national government. The civil rights movement, we see some arguments on the left and on the right making the same arguments that were made on the, on the right, that are, I mean, on the left that are being made on the right some 50 years ago about what the role of states was, what the power of states was, what role they had, how come we should now have autonomy because we don't like the federal government. But when George Wallace, inappropriately, in my view, stood in the doorway, he was arguing states' rights. He was arguing the Tenth Amendment. And so I do think that contextually, when we look at this, this notion in terms of what's on our deal, the changing role of states, there is at this time in this part of history, and we can't predict how far that's going to be because... I don't know about you guys, but when I was Speaker of the Assembly, Google didn't exist. Didn't exist when I got elected. It's crazy, right? Lyft didn't exist. Snapchat didn't exist. Twitter didn't exist. Now it defines the presidency, governing in 140 characters. That's what you do, right? If you can call that governing. But in any event, but the question is, as I see it contextually, Partly, as, as Dean Knott was talking about in my role traveling, I traveled over 100 countries while I was out of government and, and really was informed by um, the global think and the understanding that any of us get as we travel the world. That immigration is not just about Spanish speakers. There's only 371 million of those. It's about Tagalog speakers and Hindi speakers and Swahili speakers and, and, and Mandarin speakers. And that forms it's so much of the understanding of, of the globe. And so in government, our job, and what often happens in government, which is I find quite challenging, is, you know, we always tend to argue our own, our own limited point of view. Uh, you know, it's like, I'm a state person, so state's more important. I'm a federal person, so the federal government's more important. But quite frankly, the people, the public, just want you to do a good job for them. They don't know the difference there are 4,848 subdivisions of government, and if you ask Liz Hill, she can list them all. Um, in California alone, for those people who are out of California, over 1,000 school districts, 482 cities, 58 counties. Who cares? Who cares? The question is, do you deliver services for folks? How do you get the most cluck for buck for taxpayers? And how do you make sure that government's responsive to the needs of the folks that it needs to be responsive to? And so we tend to get in those fights. All I would just suggest is, is that regardless of those fights, we're at an inflection point in history, as, as uh, Dr. Pound was saying, 
because of confidence in local government, because of confidence in state government. For those who were just at NCSL, we saw Frank Lutz do a presentation in very detailed talking about that important point, where the states have become more important. And what I want to argue is a couple of other things that I think are pretty critical in terms of what's happening with the states. One, on the international level, there is a deeper recognition um, of subnational governments. Part of it was driven by the environmental movement, you know, with Paris and all the accords and all the years, starting out in Rio in 92 and all of those things. And part of it is just an understanding that globalization works better at the more local level. I went to Hawaii as part of this group with the State Legislative Leaders Foundation that oversees the National Speakers Conference, and we had the first conference of subnationals between the states and the various provincial governments of China. I've been to China going for since 1986. I've been to every province, special district, autonomous region, and municipality in China. And I now go and meet with provincial leaders because they are concerned about our states and what happens. When you go there, you'll see that. And so those relationships are important because they understand there's a shift, if you will, internationally. It started in the environmental space, but it's transcending all across the lines. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, particularly because of the environmental issues and the opportunities to work environmentally. You know, we in government often create these artificial lines in the skies as human beings and say, this is a state or this is a city. Well, Mother Earth doesn't tell you, that it doesn't respect those lines. It doesn't matter what you think in your head as a human being where the lines are. Earth decides it. Watersheds decide what those lines are. The, the blowing winds decide it. The tides decide it in terms of what happens. And so I think that that's been a big factor in informing one of the other things. Obviously, globalization, which I'm going to talk about and what that work looks like. Next, I think that Pound referred to this. I suspect there was some discussion of this earlier in the morning, but... You know, I talked to my buddy Dennis Cardoza, who was the Rules Committee chairman when I was here before, served for many years after um, Gary Condit in, in Congress and who I worked with to create the 10th campus for UC. And, you know, he told me, Hertzberg, when you go back in government, it's totally different. You have no idea how different it is. Those cameras, people take pictures of you everywhere. Everything you say is recorded everywhere. And so as a consequence, and what happens on these social media's deals is that someone have a blog, only 50 people respond to it, but it scares you because it looks professional. It doesn't look much different than the LA Times or these other people. And I see it politically. It's fundamentally, I think, and what we see in Congress is had a chilling effect on the ability to compromise. I don't believe partisanship is greater. I am a contrarian in that regard. I don't, I don't believe in partisanship as a core message driver. I believe it's self-interest of politicians, and politicians are responding to where their interests are. What are their interests? I don't judge them for it, but their interests are getting re-elected. And if you have a group in your, in your community that's going to make a bunch of noise, some small group that's whatever their interests are, you're scared of that. You're scared that this group A or group B is going to go out after you, and so you don't want to make a bunch of noise. And so the social media has created this noise which made it harder for folks to compromise. And again, going back to the environmental space, you know, the idea when Barack was trying to do environmental stuff and, and you know, this whole idea of one size not fitting all, the South, you know, and the issues of coal areas and the South and, and you know, different areas driving the, the economy, he couldn't put a deal together because of these small interests and their artificial impact. Before, people always had an opinion. They just didn't have an ability to express it. If I'm sitting here and I'm pissed off at some legislator or congress member, I can't do anything about it. I'm going to write a letter. It's going to be sent. It takes three weeks. I vey. I forgot to do it. I didn't get stamps. I don't have an envelope. Whatever. Right now, I just tick off a tweet. There's all avenues to make that happen. So people's emotions always existed. They just didn't have the tools to be able to communicate, which has created this level of consequence, which in my judgment has, 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 been, has been a facilitator in exacerbating the devolution of power. Um, also, globalization has fundamentally changed the game. In the old days, you, you know, in Los Angeles, globalists, I mean, you had General Motors and Firestone Tires and all those people and 5,000 people in the San Fernando Valley going to the place, 5,000 people leaving. Today, people can work in their backyard. 
You, you know, it's fundamentally different. JetBlue tore apart all their call centers and everybody works out of their houses and just calls in. I mean, you know from the LA stuff, calls in and, and uh, on their computer. More and more people, more millionaires can work out of their homes and you can do deconsolidation centers, contract with other people all over the world. And that's fundamentally created the underlying economic impetus for the devolution. I would also suggest that there's a political reason for devolution in the sense to, to the states because it's easier. The old model framed in the civil rights movement and framed in some of the other arguments of, uh, uh, of politics was Democrat versus Republican. Democrats wanted centralized government. Republicans wanted decentralization. Now, politically, what's happened is there's a convergence. When you go to Maldef or Naleo, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, right? 30-some years ago that didn't exist. Today, there's 7,000 members. And I remember talking to some of the members. I've been very active in, in the Latino community for many years. And, like, their attitude was, oh, all of a sudden, you know, you, you guys, the, the power shifts to Sacramento or shifts nationally, and now we got elected to these jobs. It doesn't have any meaning. I remember working on Re Hilda Solis, who became Secretary of Labor, now Supervisor in Los Angeles County, when she was running for Rio Hondo Community College Board of Trustees, you know, it's like, wait a second, I got this title, I'm the first Latina to, org to be elected, but, like, you guys in Sacramento tell us what to do, you know? It's the three white guys up there telling them what to do. It's, and so they're like, hey, wait a second, we want to devolve power. So the notion of people having that, that those job titles mean that there's this convergence that exists now, I think, in terms of the reason why states actually, and local governments in large measure, it depends on how big the local governments are, actually fundamentally um, have the opportunity. And the last thing I want, big, a couple more pictures, but the big picture, again, the notion of here, the changing role of the states. Let me tell you something. This changing role is happening generationally. It's not just rich versus poor. It's not just national, it's generationally. And here's what I mean. These kids that grow up today, you guys over there in school, you guys sit, you're, we have computers you're talking to. Your look, teacher talks about something, you're looking it up on Google. You, 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 you don't use, I was talking to somebody in China hasn't used cash in a year. Everything is different. Everything is mobile. Their news is different. Their whole sources are different. How does that affect us as people in government who care about government and what that looks like? And how do we, as our generation, focus on a world that they're taking over who works on completely different rules? And that relates to government. When I was a kid and you wanted to go in government, you either went in government, the Kennedy thing and all that stuff, or you went in the Peace Corps, whatever. I'm writing a book right now, I've been working on it for the last year and a half, called Fresh Eyes. Fresh Eyes. Governing in an era of unprecedented change. I have two co-authors. I'm 62 years old. One co-author is 20 years old. He's a USC student. He's a senior at USC. Brilliant kid. MOOC scholar. And another kid, Yale dropout at 22. And the Yale dropout's worth about $500 million. And we've got this whole group of people, and, and part of our theory, and this relates to my idea about the divide, which is what we're trying to do in the book. You read Tom Friedman's books, and what do you get? Brilliantly written stories, and you get to the end, it just says, ah, we need the political will. Ah, we need the political will. Screw you, the political will. How do you get it done, right? Then you read the magic books, the Second Machine Age, and all these other books that talk about the notion of of, of, you know, what's going to happen with 3D printing and the driverless cars and the future of work and the stuff that scares us to death, right? And, and you read that stuff and everybody goes, oh my God, what am I going to do? Everybody who cares about the status quo in government is schwitzing. And so the question is, the question is, what's the future? How do you get there? We have been here before. If you read Walter Lippmann, if you look at, if you read the bully pulpit and what, what Teddy Roosevelt dealt with and McClure and all the basic muckrakers in those days, if you're a student of history, we have been here before. These are just challenges that each generation has to face. But the fundamental difference and what I talk about the divide for all of us is the next generation. You have to understand what those solutions look like. So our basic premises is what are the laws of physics of politics? whether it's Julius Caesar, Thomas Jefferson, or Donald Trump, 
we all know in, the, in this space that there's certain basic rules of enlightened self-interest and how the world works, so much of what the framers talked about. Secondly, what are the irreversible trends? What's going to happen with mobility and digitization and artificial intelligence? And what we talk about, which goes to my third point that's so important, is the notion we initially called it extra-governmentality, which I'm sc scoping because it's too hard of a word to be related to. But the idea of governing without government. And that is these kids that we're interviewing all over the world are kids who don't think about government. They don't think about it, but they do care. They want to go to not profits, not for profits. They do want to engage. They do want to participate. They just have different tools in order to deliver the same public policy instincts, the same public policy DNA. They just, you know, I mean, this doesn't relate to the states, but I'm interviewing this woman uh, uh, who, who's doing um, research in Africa and all across the world on torture. She wants to stop torture. She's got some guy who sits in his basement who writes briefs about torture. He's never been to Africa, but he's helping and participating, and he's sitting at his computer writing briefs. He couldn't do that before in the way the world worked. There's, there's all sorts of new tools. 16-year-old kid raised $100 million to help clean up the ocean. Never thought about getting involved in government. I was in China four weeks ago meeting with a kid um, who's, who's come up with a way to solve air quality in buildings in a whole different way. He's from India. Another woman from Cuba working on, on new algorithms to deal with environmental quality and the like. My point is, is that these are opportunities for us that we have to fundamentally as policymakers embrace. And my point is at the state level, to some extent on bigger cities at the local level, where this can get done. I don't believe for the reasons they articulated that national government is going to be meaningful. Uh, still, you know, I just don't think so. And I think actually from a very deep intellectual way and not a politically appropriate way, Donald Trump is actually a blessing in disguise within a very limited context, and that is he's quickening that process. Because what's happened as a consequence, which I'm sure you've heard in your panel discussions, and what we're doing is, you know, Schwarzenegger did it, Brown's doing it at a much love, bigger level of working at the directly among governments, right? I, Oregon was up here meeting with us just back at NCSL, talking at a much deeper level than we've done before. Uh, 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 SL State Legislative Leaders Foundation bought a big place to convene speakers from all around the country to talk about ideas, to share ideas at a much deeper level than we've done before. So there's a quickening in that process because people realize that the federal government is challenged, to say the least, in that regard. And so, you know, I, I come here, and partly I'm mean, here because obviously as a board member this is important to me and D not called, and the answer is yes, so next case. But, but the idea of having public policy as an important endeavor is more critical today than ever. Pepperdine, USC, uh, UCLA, at, at Claremont, more important than ever. And what I would suggest to the teachers is to listen to the students, to be guided by the students. I gave the commencement address at Berkeley at the Public Policy School, Goldman School, not too long ago, and to be guide, guided by the students because in history, there's this next generation has tools. 500 years ago, the kid and the grandkid and the great kid, kid did what the grand, great grandfather did in the same place, and they learned from him. Today, that's on its head, and that we've got to understand this new change in terms of creating the governance. And, and I would just suggest that speed to market is everything. This notion of people who work in the mobile space, when with the more private sector does all this stuff, and, and you get it online, you get it at your fingerprints, gov I mean, your fingertips. Government is designed to be slow and yesterday to protect against tyranny. Now what happens is if we're going to build confidence in government, we got to speed it up. we got to change the game. we got to make it more accessible. we got to make it more relatable. we got to make it more readable. Why is Hamilton so good? Because it tells the story of the old white guys in a relatable way. Right? That's what they do. The story isn't any different. They didn't rewrite history. They just threw in a couple immigrants and some rap and some funk and some other stuff and made it relatable. The story is the same. The values are the same. The message is the same. Right? I mean, I saw it. Right? Thomas Jefferson's black. Uh, Bur Aaron Burr's black. George Washington's black. I think Madison was Puerto Rican. Pretty cool. You know? So... 
the bottom line is this in my message of being here today, why it's so important is this. One, man never, ever before has the need to think about this stuff been greater. This is not going to happen on the margins. You gotta get in the game. You gotta think this stuff through at a much deeper level. You gotta help inform the public debate. We in government are still too reliant on the status quo. All the interests that come before you are just fuller brush salesmen selling their product. What you guys do is integrate the think. Give the big think. Understand it in the bigger context. It is critically important. Am I going on too long? Two more minutes? You know? But so, because in history, in 1893, at the World's Fair, when they asked the greatest thinkers to predict the next 20 years, not one of them predicted the, the, the rise of the automobile. We don't know. None of us 20 years ago could have predicted these devices having more power than what it took to go to the moon. It's crazy. I spent $10,000 on my first computer thing that had like nothing power. It's, it's crazy. You know how difficult it is. And so the world is changing. We've got to embrace it. We've got to celebrate who we are. I think that the reason I, I've been at government for 12 years and I came back inspired. I'm, it's hard. It's hard to swallow the crap that I got to swallow. It's hard to watch what's happening. I'm not suggesting it's easy, but I see the light. I see the hope. I see the opportunity for us in government to do great things. I see it in historical context that we have been here before. I am inspired by so many of the quotes from Walter Lippmann and so many others historically that have looked back. I got this great quote from Martin Luther about the, the utterly dissolute and disrespectful youth circa 1542. This is the way it works. We always tend to look at this stuff. And I would just suggest that in our generation, we have different kinds of challenges, but we didn't have to fight wars and be the greatest generations and lose family members at a significant level. The nature of our challenges because of globalization is different. You read the Millennial Report from the United Nations, there's more people on Earth that are living at a higher level of, uh, uh, of, of livelihood. They have less disease. It's just they're not here. We just happen to be at the top of the heap, and we just got to figure out how to be Muhammad Ali and 70 years old and still win the championship. We just got to figure out how to win that game, and that's not that hard is my point. And the bottom line, and I'll close on this, is just, you know, I mean, the reason why I, I gave up all my other boards and all this stuff, but the reason why I stay in the public policy game, the reason why I'm associated with uh, Dean Knott and do what I do is because I think that you guys are the future. And I do think that the notion of that there's honor in this business and that just because the world's changing doesn't mean that you're less important. I would suggest that you're more important than ever. And I appreciate the invitation to be here and to speak to everybody. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Human nature is human nature. At the end of the day, this business is about human beings. If the tools are different, then the tools are different. The idea of bringing people together, being human, doing a human level that uh, Supervisor Edelman did, uh, Rich, are exactly the same. I would argue they're more important now than ever. They're just exercised in with different tools. Ed didn't know how to use the internet and use social media. That's now a tool that you can't ignore. Ed worked at a different pace in how he worked and did stuff differently. So I would just, I would suggest that the thinking is, is such a way that it, it, it is critical. I would just say it's a little different in the sense of how you accomplish it. You know, I, I came back in the first two years in the Senate, I didn't open my yapper because everybody expected Hertzberg to come back as former speaker to say, oh, he knows he's going to come back and say he knows everything. You know, it's exactly opposite. I listened and I focused on the next generation to listen to what they had to say to try to understand what tools we had to make the fix. Okay, good. Uh, we thank our two speakers again. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you.